welcome all of you to this wonderful Easter morning, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which put everything into motion. This is Love is our series that begins today. I'm preaching this morning about love that forgives. Love that forgives. In honor of the word of the Lord, which is our customer on here, could I ask you to stand one more time? Luke chapter 24, the gospel according to Luke. Again, thank you for being here to the praise team. Thank you for your investment in this church service. Praise God. What a wonderful day. Praying everybody will have a great afternoon. Enjoy your families, your Easter eggs, all these things. Luke chapter 24 reads as so early, very early Sunday morning, the women came to the tomb where Jesus' body was laid. They brought the sweet-smelling spices they had prepared. They saw that the heavy stone that covered the entrance had been rolled away. They went in, and here's the whole Easter celebration. But they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They went in, but they did not. Someone shout back, they did not. Find the body of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to preach to you this morning on this is love. Heavenly Father, help me once again on a beautiful Easter in Southern California that the Spirit would flow liberally from heaven, God, upon my mind and thoughts. Allow me to speak your words, God. Allow me to articulate your Spirit to help somebody, to bless somebody, to encourage somebody on this Easter day, God, that your love, God, flows from heaven and through the heavenlies, flows from Calvary into this sanctuary in Old Town Temecula today. Let there be no distractions, God. We lend an ear to you for the next few minutes. Anoint us, I pray. And if you receive that prayer, could you shout back amen? Amen. 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 Thank you again for standing this morning. This is love. The resurrection changed everything. El resurrección cambió todo. That was actually a bigger amen on the second one. Because of the resurrection, we know what the cross is all about. Because of Easter, we understand the meaning of Good Friday. You see, at the cross, Jesus died in place of our sins. Jesus entered into our pain and our shame. Jesus took back every weight of evil itself so that the power could and would be broken. And it's because Jesus did this. He did not stay in the grave. We see that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was his love freeing us from sin, the bondage of sin. God in his love overcame death. God in his love announcing that one day we will be a new creature. This was a new revelation. This was a a new news. Because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see that God really is love. And when he took a look at the cross, he realized that this is the true meaning of love. God in his love was freeing us, you and I, from sin. Normally, I don't think most of us don't really want to ask God for help. We want to try to figure things out on our own. But when that happens, we put matters into our own hands. And the mess ensues, and we resist asking for help. And when we get that far down the road, it becomes a little embarrassing, or we're ashamed, a little awkward asking for help to resolve a mess that maybe we have put in motion, maybe partially self-inflicted. Maybe we're at fault. and We don't want to admit our guilt. Guilt is uncomfortable. I understand that. An uncomfortable feeling. Sorry is an uncomfortable word. Is it hard for you to say I'm sorry? Is that easy? I think what most of us in humanity would like to deny it or ignore it. Yeah, we'll recover on our own and we'll justify our actions, but admitting it is painful. And yet, it won't go away. The pain, the shame, the feeling that we've fallen short, that we have failed, that just eats away at us over time. We tend to mask our shortcomings so that we can recast it in someone else's fault. I'm like this because of my parents, my community that I live in, a poor education. The system failed me in some way. But my friend, that doesn't really erase the problem. If anything, it exasperates, it expands it. 
And is it just as individuals who have failed? It's communities and systems. It's not really the problem. The real problem is what the Bible would call this one three-letter word, sin. Sin is what? It's a sense of missing the mark, of falling and failing to be who God created us to be. Sin is a sense of just an essence of rebellion. What does that mean? That's a strong word. It's, that's turning away from God. A decision to move away or against God, to be independent of God. Sin is a transgression. It's a crossing of the lines, the crossing of the boundaries, a violation of another person. Taking it all together and bringing it in, it, a life like that just ends us down to a dead end. A dead-end road where maybe you feel exasperated and maybe you've been at a dead-end road in life. There's an example in the Bible that gives me hope. One of Jesus' main followers had fallen short in a spectacular way. In fact, his failure was so dynamic and so epic, epic that his story had to be told here. You see, his name was Peter. He wasn't just a follower of Christ. He was one of his closest friends. And his sin was not just crossing the line in a minor area, but it was a big shortcoming. His sin was a flat-out denial of Jesus Christ. Peter, rubbing shoulders with Jesus, living a life and traveling, seeing the miraculous, the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. And we know the story. When it came to crunch time, when the pressure was on, Peter denied him. And then now Peter has to live with that shame and that guilt, that condemnation that he looks back and thought, oh, if I could only play it over again, if I could only roll the clock back and I could make a different decision, and maybe you're here this morning and you wish, if I could just only have said no to that phone call or not gone to that place, if I would have just kind of stayed in that night, if I would have kind of just erased that one day from my life, I wouldn't feel all the shame and the guilt, but that, that's passes. That's the past, and we don't have no way to reach back in the past. I think all of us here, there's not one of us among us that say, you know what, if I had things to do over again, in some situations I would make a different decision. I think the answer is yes among us all. But since I can't go back, Brother Blair, I've got to understand I'm here today and I want to move forward. Peter finds himself that way. I denied the Christ blatantly, overtly, just Straight up, I don't know him. It's kind of called on it by a little girl. Talks about him. We hear the news of Jesus is alive, and Peter and John ran to the empty tomb, and John got there first, the Bible says, and Peter would follow. And I imagine Peter's following a little tentative and behind, and John seeing the grave clothes lying there, stained and soiled in an empty tomb, and Peter thought, I wonder what's going on here. Jesus appears to the disciples passing, passing through locked doors as if that weren't enough. And Thomas asked him, hey, let me see your wounds. Who are you? Are you really the Jesus we knew? He shows him his hands and his feet. At this point, I'm thinking, what's Peter thinking? What's Peter feeling like? Jesus is alive? Maybe it only makes things worse, does it? knowing that I should not have denied him. But he knows that I did. How could I ever face him? See, it's hard to say I'm sorry. Especially when the wrong cuts deep. How could Peter ever recover from this? Peter was supposed to be the leader you, you, Peter walked on water. He had confessed him as the Messiah. And then now he denies him. How, think about this. How could Peter's credibility, credibility be regained with Jesus and his friends? I'm sure this hung over him. You see, this is what I know that shame isolates people. It tells us that we're the only ones. It says that our sin is uniquely disqualifying. And no one else has done anything ever quite like this. It makes us the exception in the worst way. That's what sin does. 
That's what guilt does. That's what shame does. We're the only person who can't be forgiven. We've done the one thing that cannot be set right. We've gone past the point of no return. We've fallen too far. As the Bible puts it in Romans, the wages of sin is death, and the the enemy just pounds that into our life. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Shame, the kind that comes from guilt, tells us that our story is over and your story is without Jesus. But here's the beautiful thing. Watch this. Jesus meets Peter where he's at. Peter tries to retreat to his old familiar place, to his comfort zone. And Jesus meets him there. You see, when we retreat in shame, Jesus comes after us again and again and again. I love the song we sing. It's called Reckless Love. The words say, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 90 and 9. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you gave yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And Maybe in the context of that song and where you live this morning, God's love is trying to chase you down and find you, and leave the 90 and 9. I know we don't earn it, we don't deserve it, but because of Calvary, he gave himself away. He hung on a cross some 2,000 years ago, which was preceding the outpouring of the Spirit, which the Spirit is what cleanses us and makes us redeemable. That is the love I'm preaching about. That is the love that forgives. That is the love that restores. That is the love that mends. That is the love that opens up the door to usher us back into our relationship with God. What a love. He will never stop chasing you. Say, well, I don't deserve to be chased. Well, that's your opinion, but that's not the Calvary's opinion. I've given up on God. That's your opinion. That's not Calvary's opinion. I don't even know if I believe in a God. That's not, that's not Calvary's opinion because he's going to still pursue you because Calvary is not in vain. He came to seek and to save everybody. Everybody, I said. The blood of Calvary reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley and it reaches over every person. And anything that we've ever done, it can be put under the blood of Calvary. You can never do nothing so great and so grand and so out there so far that the blood of Calvary cannot cover it and wash away your sins. I need to tell you that. How's that? Because that's love. You can never go too far that the love of God can't find you. You can never hide in such a secluded place that the love of God cannot find you somewhere. You see, because he finds the heart, he finds the mind, he finds the spirit. And wherever the spirit and the heart and the mind is, there, that's where you are. So I feel like I need to kind of just inch, encourage someone this morning that, please understand that this is love. What is love? God's mercy and grace extending from Calvary. So I really, really haven't really figured it out. I haven't really lived a good life. I feel like my whole life is jaded and stained and peppered with bad decisions. That's all right because that's the power of Calvary. That's the power of Easter, that, that God rose again for people like you and I, my friend. You extract the spirit, you extract God out of any one of us, and we don't have the ability to do what's right either. But it's the liberty of God's spirit. What Jesus did for Peter He wants to do for us. You see, this series called This is Love. The next two weeks, we're going to be preaching on it again. Next week, it's called Love That Conquers. Week number three, leading up to Mother's Day, it's Love That Makes All Things New. What are you doing? I'm encouraging you to be a part of this series, three-part series. Love is, every week, it's something different. 
Love that forgives us this week. God's going to forgive somebody in this house today, I promise you. Before we conclude, your Easter morning is going to be forgiven of your past and your guilt and your shame. And you don't have to be isolated anymore. You can come out of hiding. Why? Because God's going to repair you and restore you and love you like nobody else can love you in this world. That's what the voice of God is saying to someone this morning. Next week, we're going to preach about conquering death. And next week, making all things new. The risen Jesus breathes new life, the life of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost who raised Jesus from the dead is now into his followers. That's you and I. What does that mean? No more fear. No more shame. No more guilt. Replaced with peace. The true deep sense of being put back together again, made whole, restored, set right, right with God and right with one another. That's what the Spirit of God does. It reconciles people's lives. And when my life gets reconciled, it reconciles me with other people that maybe have hurt me or maybe I've hurt them. You see, the sword cuts both ways on hurts. And so it makes me who God wants me to be so I can reconcile with the people around me. And even to say I'm sorry to God is a big challenge in a tall order. But then to say I'm sorry to someone else, and maybe you're right afraid, well, it's not my fault. But God helps us reconcile and restore relationships. I don't believe that any of us should be going through life with strained relationships when there's a power of God that can put things back together. I might have to put that in motion. I might have to step up. I might have to facilitate that. I might have to broker that. But you know, with the Spirit of God, God makes all things new. And when the pain gets so bad, I'm willing to step forward and get things fixed. Can you shout amen? Several years ago, I had surgery on both my hands. I'm afraid of needles, so I asked him if he could do both hands at one time. And my wife said, no, there's some things you need your own hands for. I can't help you there. I'm going to leave it right there. No, I'm not doing that. But I say, I don't like needles. Can I get, is there another guy in the house that doesn't like needles? I'm the only sissified guy when it comes to needles. I go in the doctor's office and say, oh, what are you going to do with, where are you going to stick that? I just got healed. I'm good. The Lord's a healer. Okay, watch this. With my hand surgery, my hands were curling in. It was so painful. It would wake me up at night. I'd lay on my hands and it would hurt. The pain got so unbearable that the surgery and all I had to go through sound like much more comfort than what I'm doing with my hands just trying to live my life. I couldn't type. I couldn't shave with my right hand. I learned to shave left-handed. I learned to brush my teeth left-handed. I learned to type left-handed. The pain was so bad, Brother Gustavo. I said, you know, okay, that needle is probably a glorious needle. (laughs) Poke it in me and let's go. But I only felt like that when the pain got so unbearable. And maybe that's where we got to get for God to restore and refresh us. They say, you know, I'm tired of living like this. My life is not what I thought it would be. I didn't plan this. I didn't expect things to turn out this way. Part of it, I made bad decisions. Part of it, people did to me. But in the course of who I am, my life is so hurting that I need God to touch me. And you push back past that hurt. And any fear or any inadequacy or any shame you might have, you say, I want this all repaired because I want to be a new person. And the pain is way more than I can take than coming out of darkness and coming out of hiding and letting God's love make me a brand new person. And maybe there's someone here this morning that say, you know, that's exactly how I feel. Because of the resurrection, that pain can be forgiven. That pain can be taken away. That pain makes us feel like we're missing the mark. We're falling short. Our transgressions are crossing the lines, are being forgiven Because Jesus rose from the dead is a possibility today for every one of us. And maybe you're a follower of God and maybe you have God's spirit, but maybe there's still pain in your life. I'm not preaching to just guests alone. I'm preaching to the church and the body of Christ this morning. Because pain happens along the way. And the power of sin tries to paralyze us. The power of sin tries to pattern itself after us in failure and brokenness. I like the scripture in Ephesians chapter 2 and 1. It says this, at one time you were dead 
because of your sins. At one time, you were dead because of your sins. But I like this other verse here, quote, rather, death is the end of all possibilities. At one time, you see, to be forgiven is to be free. Free from what? Free from guilt, free from shame, free from the power that enslaves me. I'm not enslaved. I can do whatever I want. But what about in your mind and your spirit? What about the relationships in your life? What about things that have bound you that you can't seem to break free from? To be what God made us to be, to reflect his image, his wisdom, his love into this whole world. You see, this is what I know that Peter's life changed that day. You got to understand this. You got to get this, the backstory. Peter walked on water. Peter was a close friend of him. And yet he makes a bad decision at just a moment. Pressure, embarrassment, insensitive. The little girl asks him about, aren't you? Aren't you? I know you. He tries to prove his point. But Peter's life was changed that day. I'm trying to show you what can happen when God steps into your life. And he went on to lead the start of a movement that would be called the church. Watch this. There's a section of Peter's life where he's a friend of Jesus. He walks on water. He denies him. and He leaves him and he runs and he hides. And then he's the movement to be called that starts the church. In the middle of what Peter was, great, bad decisions, great Somewhere in the middle of his life, he turned back and God stepped in. Watch, I gotta, I, you got to get this. You see, God trusted him again to start the movement of the early church in the book of Acts. Not only did Peter, I, this is what I think. I think that Peter struggled more with it than Jesus did. Jesus said, you know what, I, I trust you. I want you to be the spokesman. There's going to come a day and they're going to say, what meaneth this? And you're going to stand to the crowd that day and you're going to say, except you repent of your sins and baptize in the name of Jesus. You shall no wise enter into the kingdom of God. You, you've got to be born again. You, you've got to tell them, Peter. You see, when this happens, Peter, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to bring my spirit back 50 days later and we're going to call it the day of Pentecost. But I'm going to trust you to lead the movement and lead the charge and the coalition. But Peter said, well, don't you remember... I kind of said some bad words, and I was embarrassed. Jesus said, I forgive you. Now, why do I forgive you? I need you to do something for me. I need you to declare what people must do to be saved. So wherever you are in your life, in your quest to be who you want to be, God wants to step in and speak. And what we do, we, we mask the hurt and the pain because we feel, like I've already mentioned, that we are the only one. But there are people in the house today that God has forgiven all of us. And we don't air what God has forgiven us. We don't want nobody to know. These are things between us and God. And, and as one person said, it's under the blood. What does that mean? Because of Calvary, I can be forgiven. And the scars and the hurt and the pain can be wiped away. And the bomb of Gilead can be put on all of my deeds that were awful to God and contrary to the word of God. You see, a deep love for Jesus anchored him through the most difficult days of his life, Peter. It all began that day when Jesus found him on the shores and restored him. My friend, can I tell you today that your life can be changed the whole trajectory of your life can change today. Amen. Maybe you've thought you've hit a dead end because of the mistakes you've made, the destruction or destructive habits that have caught up with you. But I got good news for you. It isn't over. Just as it wasn't over that day when Jesus died. Amen. It's called Good Friday. A couple of days later, he, he raised us from the dead. And because he carried our sins upon him on the cross, because God raised from the dead, that, that we are able to live in victory over sin and death. Sin is not the end, my friend. Sin is not the end. I said it already, but listen, the resurrection changed everything. Everything. 
Scripture says it this way. God shows his love for us because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, while we were stuck in our sin, while we were caught in a trap, Jesus died for us. Before we knew how to call his name, before we knew who he was, he came running after us. He came looking for us. He came searching for us. Remember, reckless love. There's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. You're coming after me. There's nothing that is between you and God right now that you think cannot prevent God from getting to you if you'll just turn to God. Amen. What about my past? What about my scars? What about my sin? What about what I did last night? What about where I went last night? That was last night. Today's a new day. You see, one day, Jesus is dead in a tomb. And the next day, the tomb is empty. So what happened the day before had no power on what was getting ready to happen in the tomb. What do you mean? I simply mean what you did last night has no power on what you can decide today. That you can make a cognitive decision within your mind and spirit. Say, God, I think I'm kind of like Peter. I've done some things. I've said some things. I've gone some places and I've thought some things and I... I just, I'm hurting, and I'm wounded, and I'm angry. You can help me, God? The answer to the question is yes, he can. Because of Calvary. Because of Easter. You see, here, this would be the problem, okay? If they went to the tomb that day, and the stone was still sealed... And they roll it back and Jesus is still there. What? Houston, we got a problem. But that's not how the story is written and it's not how it ended. The mere fact that he rose from the dead, he appeared unto his disciples 50 days later, the day of Pentecost was poured out. And although it's a tomb... The spirit that replaced the man, Christ Jesus, is the Holy Spirit. And that is available for you and I. It lives in us. I repent of my sins. I'm baptized in the name of Jesus. What does that do? That washes away my sins. That makes me a clean vessel. And God fills me with his spirit. And that's how we live 2,000 years after Calvary. You see, Easter is not just a history story. If there was no Spirit of God living inside of us, you might convince me. Oh, that's just a story that died back then. That's like Christopher Columbus. He discovered America. That's over. George Washington was the first president. Oh, that's been gone for years. That's just history. But what makes this story relevant today and still alive and breathing is that there are people that have been filled with his spirit. And it's not just a story on black and white printed paper at a print shop somewhere. It's the spirit of the living God that allows us to break way from our hurt and our pain and reconcile with God. And when God reconciles with us, we reconcile with each other. And we become a temple of the Holy Spirit because of the Spirit of God. And today, I can be a new creature. You see, this is love right here. And it can change everything. 
This is love. Our series, this is love. And this changes everything. Could you stand with me this morning as I close? There's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up. There's no wall you won't kick down. No lie you won't tear down. You're coming after me. You're coming after me. You know why why is God so relentless? Because he went to Calvary for us. The price has been paid. So he's pursuing and he's chasing and he's following because of the power of Calvary. Wherever you are in life, whatever station you find yourself in this morning, listen to me real quick. God wants to step into that very station and love you. I don't feel lovable. God loves you and he will love you. What do I have to do with it? I just got to give him a chance. This is love. Give love a chance. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, in your holy name, I pray that the spirit of love, God, the power of your Holy Spirit, God, would descend from heaven upon this house in Temecula and that us speak into the hearts and minds of your people here this morning that you would reconcile them, God, and set them free from guilt and shame and isolation, and that we would come out of darkness, God, and begin to live a life that's renewed and refreshed because of the power of Easter this year, that we would rally to the call and rally to the charge, God, that you would step in and bring a home and a life and a house, a marriage back together, or restore a mind, God, restore a spirit restore someone's health today, God, to show them the power of the bomb of Gilead, that I'm not preaching about words and just history, God. I'm preaching about the reckless love of God, that you chase us down and you pursue us, not to hurt us, not to embarrass us, but to restore us and to forgive us. And God, we give you that opportunity today. If you're here this morning, my friend, and you want to be prayed for, you want a fresh start. You want to experience and feel this love that I'm preaching about. I'm going to ask our pastoral staff to help me, but would you come? Would you make your way up here? Let us anoint you with oil. Come on, let's start fresh. Easter is about spring, and spring is about a fresh start and a newness and a cleaning. God, clean my life, clean my past, clean my memory, clean my scars. Put the bomb of Gilead up on a scar that hurts me so bad. God, I want to forget about it. I want to move forward. Show me this love he's preaching about. No shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Anybody need to lean into this love this morning? There's no wall you won't kick down. Anybody need to kind of lean into the hands of God and let him just hold you tightly? Let him wipe away a tear. Let him wipe away the pain. Let him wipe away the hurt. Why, he's coming after me because of Calvary. Here I am, God. Here's my need. Here's my confession. Here's my. There's no shadow you won't light up. Ah. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. You need comfort. No wall you won't kick down. You need a fresh touch because your strength from yesterday is gone. Come on, this is love. This is what I'm preaching about. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb, won't climb up, up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you oh, won't tear yes. down, coming after Come on. me. This is Calvary, this is Easter. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming, coming after, after me. me. Ah. There's no wall you won't 